All right, and we're live. Okay, everybody. Um, welcome to our podcast of How the Frack We Got Here. Um, of course, I um, believe you can. Um, apologize for the lateness of this video, guys. I should have been here a little bit earlier, but unfortunately, the circumstances, you know, here we are. But we're still going to get it in. Um, basically, if you've never seen this podcast before, it's us going into the daily events and politics and pretty much trying to look into, well, honestly, how the frack we got here. So just like my Oculus podcast, I am going to give this disclaimer. This is uh, a somewhat of an adult conversation, including adult language, which I will use and also my cast will use. So if you are thin skinned or have young children around, uh, feel free to make the necessary adjustments and we'll just go from there. But from the rest of you guys, welcome. So this week, I don't know about you guys, but honestly, is it getting to the point every week where we're just going to look at Agent Orange and just go, what the fuck did you do now? I mean, seriously, are we? I mean, it's almost to the point now where it's you're expecting something different. Trump, honestly, I believe in his I believe in whatever lack of brain cells he has. I truly think that he's reliving the Apprentice reality show but he's doing it from the presidential seat. That's fucking scary. What's so much scarier now, honestly, is that if you've been under a rock or if you haven't been paying attention, uh, which you should be, because considering the fact of the matter that the most recent story out there is basically uh, we are abducting kids now. And I know a lot of people out there are probably going, are we really abducting children? Yes, but we're doing it from people that are considered illegal immigrants. And like I said, if you've been under a rock, Trump has decided to basically live out one of his campaign policies. And it's not build the wall because Mexico ain't paying for it anytime soon. Oh no, he has decided to use the Department of Department of Homeland Security and the ICE agency um, to basically seek out and deport illegal immigrants. And I know for a lot of people out there, they're like, yay, we can finally get these mooching individuals off our country and send them back to where they came from. Here's the problem. It's a simple fact of the matter is that we are ripping families apart from taking children. And I don't know about you, but when did we, as far as a country, decide that, hey, we're going to kick out legal immigrants, but we're going to keep the children? And I know for a lot of you pro-lifers out there, won't somebody think of the children? Won't anybody think of the children? And I'm thinking to myself, why in the blue hell are we willing to split up a family to save the child, but we're willing to kick out the parents? And that's the part that honestly bugs me, because I've said it in many of my Facebook posts. The simple fact of the matter is that we have become, or I should say, our, our pretty much our customs and Department of Homeland Security has become the modern day Gestapo. And if you don't know what the Gestapo are, they were actually the police that pretty much persecuted Jewish people. You know, that's why they always say, you know, watch out for the Gestapo, because their sole intention was to basically commit genocide. Now, I'm not going to say the Department of Homeland Security and ICE are going to that extreme. However, the simple fact of the matter is that that we're ripping children away from their parents is something that I never thought I would hear or see on American soil. We see it everywhere else. We see it with terrorist organizations. We see it with dictators. But I never thought in a million years that we would actually see it here on the U.S. soil. Land of the free, home of the brave, the land of golden opportunity. And you basically decide that we need to take away the children from their parents and then still deport the parents. So now we have modern day concentration camps. So the interesting thing about this is, I wonder how some individuals could honestly sit there and truly, truly 
justify this decision in the post in the in the orange at the Agent Orange administration, if you will. So enter department, enter the uh, Department of Homeland Security's director, Kristen Nielsen. And it's interesting what Kristen Nielsen had happened to say when she was pressed about the decision. Make up your mind from there. Let's be honest. There are some who would like us to look the other way when dealing with families at the border and not enforce the law passed by Congress, including, unfortunately, some members of Congress. Past administrations may have done so, but we will not. We do not have the luxury of pretending that all individuals coming to this country as a family unit are in fact a family. We have to do our job. We will not apologize for doing for our job. We have sworn to do this job. This administration has a simple message. If you cross the border illegally, we will prosecute you. If you make a false immigration claim, we will prosecute you. If you smuggle illegal aliens across an extraordinarily dangerous journey, we will prosecute you. But I have also made clear you do not need to break the law of this country by entering illegally to claim asylum. If you are seeking asylum, go to a port of entry. For months, staff at CBP ICE and USCIS and I have been on the Hill briefing members about the threat posed by these loopholes and discussing ways to close them and to fix our broken immigration system. So let me take just a couple minutes to walk you through a few of these legal loopholes that DHS and you and your communities must. Okay, well, I'm gonna pretty much leave that there. The reason why I'm gonna leave that there is because the next minute and 45 that she goes into is honestly bullshit. Because Amazing to me where the first words out of her mouth, she says, we will not apologize for doing our job. Keep this in mind. They literally know what they're doing. They literally know that it's wrong and you're not going to get an apology from them. Matter of fact, they're going to sit there and say, had you followed the proper procedure, you would seek asylum. Very interesting about that, considering that about 10,000 Syrian refugees, um, Trump has turned away and actually has deported back to the country they came from. Most of them actually killed when they arrived. So your point or your port of entry excuse is honestly crappy, very crappy. Matter of fact, what people don't realize this is when you turn away illegal immigrants back to their home country, for most of them, it's a death sentence. Some of them don't, some of them have to flee for the simple fact of the matter is that if they stay, they get killed. So of course they're going to, of course they're going to enter the United States illegally because, you know, if your choices are run to the U.S. or stay and get killed, doesn't take long to figure out which one you're going to go for. But again, the problem is with this is that it's not policy that's the problem. Now, I will say this about that individual. She does bring up a wonderful fact that the immigration system is broken, but nobody chooses to fix it. I mean, well, if you think about the fact that we had the DREAM Act in under President Obama, which actually did guarantee a path of citizenship for illegal immigrants to become legal in the United States, um, that was the only time where we had somewhat a sort of an immigration policy. And Agent Orange decided to kill it. Why did he decide to kill it? Basically because he's echoing the sentiment of a lot of, uh, how can I put this ever so nicely, Hitler-related people where they truly do where they truly don't want a certain group of people here. Because keep in mind, Trump has pretty much annexed Mexico. He's annexed Africa. He's almost annexed every country except eh, Russia. But, you know, when Putin's your husband, you know, it kind of makes awkward. It actually makes awkward conversation at the dinner table when you when your when your wife decides that, you know, none of your relatives can't come over for dinner. But I digress. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that I never thought I would say in 2018, we have concentration camps. You can call them. You, I mean, they're detention centers, tent cities, no matter how you clip, no matter how you split the mustard on that. We have them now. And it's amazing to me 
amazing to me that people are not going to sit there and we're not going to have this, this, how are we not mad? I mean, I know I'm pissed because I've seen shades of this through history. I mean, you can call what you want with slavery. When we, when the South could own slaves, the North could own slaves. You can call it um, um, shanty towns. When when the Cubans were immig- when Cubans were immigrating into the U.S. through Florida, and they had shanty towns, which might as well be modern concentration camps. Uh, the actual concentration camps post World uh, World War II, where Japanese people were held in these areas out of fear that they were sleeper agents for the land of the rising sun. And let's not forget Auschwitz. Honestly, anybody who reads history knows what happened with that place. And that was genocide, plain and simple. So when you look at things as they are now, how in the world can we not sit there and not see what's going on? A modern day concentration camp in 2018 The simple fact of the matter is that we are still arguing basic human rights in 2018. That alone is fucked up. But what's so fucked up about it is, is just that the lack of actual morality and the lack of actual compassion for these people. It's not like America is crowded. I mean, we have space for individuals. I mean, we are literally a we are literally a country to ourselves that could house people from other continents. It's not that bad. But when it comes down to it, what we really don't want, what some of us really don't want to admit out there, you know, the ones that are really for this, is that simply put, they're loving this right now. They love the fact that we're kicking out people they don't like. They love the fact that we're kicking out the people they are racist and prejudiced against. They love the fact that they're seeing this and thinking how great it is to get their country back. And let me tell you something. Anyone that tells you that it's great to get our country back should be watched thoroughly. And I mean thoroughly. Because those are the individuals that will turn around, and I kid you not, I honestly kid you not, should be watched. So, aside from that, because as much as Agent Orange keeps saying, he blames the Democrats, which is the other thing I'm going to bring up. He brings up the Democrats. He brings up that it's their laws he's enacting. Um. Okay, so I, I got to stop this at this point. There is no law on the books that says that we have to separate families, immigrant families. Now, I know there's going to be some people that are going to sit there and go, well, what about what about they go to jail? Okay, that's a weak argument because let's be honest, anybody that goes to jail, of course the family's, I thought if the family doesn't have anyone that can be legal guardians for the children, of course they're going to go in the system. That is a given. But we're talking about immigrant families. Immigrant families are the ones that are suffering right now. More importantly, the children are the ones being suffered right now. So it is amazing to me how we sit there and we literally are watching the destabilization of humanity. But we're watching this from the presidential seat. And this is what scares me, especially when Trump when Trump went to go visit Kim Jong-il. Because like I said, a long time ago, this man literally was fanboying over Kim Jong-il. Fanboying, mind you. So think about this for a second. He was fanboying over Kim Jong-il. So Kim Jong-il kills people, his own family members, his own people. Trump had nothing but nice things to say about him. Trump even saluted a North Korean general. So what does that tell you? The man romanticizes ruling with an iron fist and forcing adoration for him from people who despise him. Because trust and believe, if someone was going to take out Kim Jong-il, if they could do it and get away with it, he probably still would not be alive right now. But unfortunately he is. 
And Trump thinks it's a win because he got to sit down with him and he got him to sit there and say, they'll talk about the stabilizing the nuclear weapon program, not forgetting the fact that Kim Jong-il has actually said it six, di- six different times and across four different, uh, four different occasions. The man still got nukes. So good luck, Trump, with that. But another thing that is also a story that has came up today, and I think it's kind of interesting, that as we talk about the budget, and let's be honest, probably news out there these days is where you usually see, you know, uh, housing assistance, family things, assist, uh, funding for that gets cut. Planned Parenthood is always being threatened because pro-lifers believe in the bullshit. So they try to get people who don't believe in what they want to believe into and to have the government cut their funding and shit like that. So they'll always turn around and try to make life harder for the rest of us because, let's be honest, religion does force people to do some dumb shit. So you can argue with me about that all you want to, but last time I checked, religion has always been used in every other terrorist, madman, or some cult trying to justify what they're doing. Now, I'm not saying religion is bad, but let's be honest. For those that are a part of it, I wish you guys would speak out more saying that's not us. Because in my mind, you're no different from good cops trying to sit there and say, oh, all of us are, not all of us are bad, but you won't call it the bad cops. So basically, and why I was speaking about the budget was because uh, the new, I should say, well, I won't say it's a new, uh, it's a new new story, but along the lines, this is actually the story that's been discussed since last year. So anybody who's ever looked at our budget, as far as what the national budget is. And you'll notice that a lot of our budget is honestly put toward defense. So it's interesting where the funny part about the whole thing was when they bring up defense, there was a story that's circulating out there right now that pretty much sits there and says uh, that the Pentagon, which is the spearhead of our military, by you, lost 21 million, or I should say the actual story is it cannot account for 21 trillion. And this was money that was allocated from 1985 up until now. So what's interesting about this is that they cannot account for 21 million. Think about that for a second. 20, I'm sorry, not 21 million, I apologize. 21 trillion with a T, trillion. I know we don't usually say trillion, but let's think about this for a second. 21 trillion was literally, excuse me, was literally unaccounted for. Now let's think about that for a second. Think about what you could do with 21 trillion. I mean, literally, it is an extraordinarily high amount of number. And what's so interesting about it is when you look at our budget, which um, honestly, for defense, it makes up nearly 25 percent of the federal spending budget, which now in a, which now as I'm actually bringing this up, um, it looks like in. Yeah. So literally uh, in 2018, we are spending almost close to twenty nine point two percent of the federal budget on defense. We are spending more than, we are spending at least a quarter of what we allow for government funding. And now, now you have the Pentagon, which cannot account for wherever the money has gone. Now, here's my thing. Giving, it's like giving the Pentagon money and then asking to account for something it's kind of like giving a kid a very nice sports car. He wrecks it, comes back home, and asks you for another car, but he never tells you what happened to the first car. And this cycle keeps continuing to you're like, hey, you're like on car number 14. What happened to the last 13 cars we, we, know, we bought for you? In the same sense, the Pentagon right now has to explain where $21 trillion went to. I mean, you could argue that it went to the wars. You could argue that it went to 
private military contracting. You can argue that it kind of went to literally uh, private military companies, defense contractors, things of that nature. You could argue all those things. But when it comes down to it, where did the money go? And I honestly think it is a story that needs to be followed because the Pentagon should be held with their feet to the fire. Because the truth of the matter is, we've been a country that's been at war for as long as we've been a nation. Matter of fact, there are very few instances in history where we weren't involved in conflict. And really to the point to where it's, it's almost we are a war-weary country. I mean, if you think about it, we jumped from Vietnam to Bosnia, then we went to Iraq, then we went to Afghanistan, we're still in Iraq, we're still in Afghanistan, we're somehow in Syria, we're somehow in Pakistan. We are fighting fears of war on, honestly, all four continents. I don't know about you, but if I'm a war puppeteer, it's Christmas for me. Because the defense, because Congress has to pay somebody. They're surely as shit not paying the army. Ask anybody who's in service right now. They will tell you they get paid crap, but they will pay private defense contractors buku bucks. And that's fucked up. Even so more fucked up is that you give a department, you give a department, a government department, buku dollars, and they can't tell you where it went. You're telling me out of the entire Pentagon, there's not one accountant that's got a book saying, hang on, I can account for where every dollar went. But you have a Congress who will constantly take Medicare, Social Security, uh, family assistance, housing assistance. They will take away from a lunch program before they take away from our defense. And I'm going to be honest. It has been a long, long, long time before anybody's tried to invade America. But yet we are putting more and more money into defense. But again, I kind of feel like, if anything, the Pentagon's a money pit. Because my thing is, why are they not being why are they not being held responsible for answering this question? Why are they not being held responsible for explaining where their money has went to? aside from the fact that it just went to the, to the military industrial complex, which profits off wars from either side. And that alone should tell you that there is something mysteriously wrong with the government as far as accounting for money. In the same sense that with our immigration, people always sit there and say immigration is broken. Nobody wants to fix it. Think about this for a second. And it's interesting where... Um, when you look up as far as how to be a resident, which I recommend if you ever get bored and go to Google, you should do that. Because it's the thing about it is where I would say in the U.S., the U.S., and I'm checking this out again because it's interesting where I usually tell people that in order to be a citizen in the U.S., you have to be here at least 10 years. 10 years. Think about that for a second. You have to be here 10 years before you can turn around and apply for citizenship. Think about that for a second. Now, I can understand in some areas that that might seem a little, eh, you know, 10 years, but it's, it's literally just like I have to do. I mean, that's the problem with that is actually the problem honestly, with how we deal with immigration. Because the thing about it is, like I was telling someone else, that's the reason why, if you really think about it a while back, is there, um, with immigration, like, say, for instance, if you married, a, if you if you were married to an American, that immediately grants you citizenship. Like, um, I think it was, I think they call it naturalization. There we go. Naturalization, which was basically was. Um, so if you married to an American and it went on, like I think you were married for three years, you were granted the citizenship. Now, here's the thing. Now, the thing about that is, if you look at the simple fact of the matter is that you have to jump through all these freaking hoops just to get to be a citizen. 
Imagine how hard it is to do it anywhere else. But it's funny where people sit there and go, well, it can't, it has to be the same in other countries. Really? Not really, because honestly, I'll give you a prime example. In the European in the European Union, both basically like Germany, London, um, Italy, all those other places, it's two years. I mean, you can apply for a for a visa, for resident visa while you stay, but as long as you've lived there for a permanent two years, you can apply for citizenship. What's their citizenship and how that goes? It is a form, a simple two-page form. And that two-page form goes to the state, they validate it, which is usually less than 90 days, and if they approve it, you basically go through naturalization and bingo, bango, you're a citizen. Literally the fast food of citizenship. In America, quite different because our immigration system is so fucked up that a person could apply for citizenship in 2001, and if they stick with it and they have a lawyer, they'll finally be granted citizenship by the time President Obama's elected. You're telling me it takes seven years for an individual from 2001 to 2008 to become a naturalized citizen, and yet they wonder why so many are coming in illegally? The system is broken, simply put, because they don't want to fix it. Because too many employers make too much money off the backs of legal immigrants because they do the jobs nobody wants. But the funny part is you have the other side going to sit there and tell them that, hey, they're the ones taking your jobs, which is not true. They're just doing the jobs you don't want to do. Because I've always said it best, when you remove those very same people you have been told to hate, then you will see the impact that they have on our economy. You will see the impact they have on these jobs that you swear up and down you want to have, and now you'll get to have them, but then you'll also sit there and swear up and down you don't want to do them. Because I guarantee you best. I, I, the day I see a colonizer in the field, in the same field that an immigrant was working for 40 hours on minimum wage and is complaining, that'll be the day I'll sit there and say, this is what you wanted. You wanted a country that was truly your own. You wanted a country that you wanted to make great again. You wanted a country, simply put, was yours. And that you could sit there and look from left to right and go, I don't see a Mexican. I don't see an Ethiopian. I don't see an Indian person. I don't see anyone here that I didn't want here because they didn't do what I wanted them to do to get here in the first place. Basically what, basically, what we have here is a bunch of racists not really wanting to fix a system. You have some, you also have a department that is literally built on our defense that is, that can account for money, a large sum of money. $21 trillion honestly could pay for the college education of every American in the United States four times over to a four year college. Like we could literally have the free college education that Bernie Sanders was trying to push through, and we could have had that and then some with twenty one trillion dollars. We could have fixed our insurance. We could have fixed our bridges and roads, the same ones that are crumbling right now. We could have actually fixed so much shit. The national deficit would have actually taken a big hit in the right direction had we applied that same amount of money to our national debt. Again. Follow the money in all things, and you'll be surprised what you wind up with. But when you really look at things, and this is and this is where uh, we will come to an end on this. But when you look at the fact of the way the America is, and I love Childish Cambino's "This Is America." Some people won't because it shows the truth about America. And so, fact of the matter is, they sh it showed such a raw view of what we're dealing with. You have Nazis in the presidential seat ripping away children from parents and siding for safety. You have the Department of Homeland acting like the fatherhood home, uh, acting like the fatherland. All we're missing is the right and the swastikas in the outfits. And the funny part is, they're the same people kicking you in the face, spitting on you, spitting on you, taking away your screaming children, and saying to you, it's fair. That's the problem. But again, as long as Agent Orange is there, this is what this is what unfortunately we're stuck with. 
because this is how you make great America again. This is how you make uh, America great again, unfortunately, by whitewashing it. But unfortunately, as far as this week goes, it is a very somber week. It is a week that when you take those three stories and think to ourselves, and I love when people say America is the greatest country in the world. Now, if you ever seen the show, The Newsroom, I love The Newsroom. I still watch all three seasons, you know, front to back because I think it's the best piece of writing. And the Jeff Daniels character says, when they ask him a question, do you think America is the greatest country in the world? He goes, no, there is theoretically no evidence to suggest that America is not the greatest country in the world. You know, we're behind in math, science, literacy, all of these things that all these other countries have gotten right. So-called third world countries have gotten right. But you know what we're number one in? Prison population. We make more money off the, we make more money off stuffing out more people in prisons than any other nation combined. And we beat people. We actually beat Japan, Australia, and every other country by a freaking country mile. So that tells you that America is always for profit. And even from the even from the remainder of, of, of the Glass Steel Act, which basically caused the recession, and now that Dodd Frank has been ripped apart, again, when you remove the line between commercial banks and Wall Street banks and you give Wall Street house money, history is bound to repeat itself. But unfortunately, that's how the frack we got here. So that's going to be the end of this podcast, guys. Again, I do apologize for the lateness of it. Um, I promise it'll be a little bit more better because I usually set these up for Sunday. But unfortunately, circumstances have called me to stay. So this isn't the only podcast that we have. Of course, I have my other one, the Off Limits Podcast, where nothing is off limits, which we usually do every Saturday between 3 and 5 p.m. Central Time that I always broadcast on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, just like this show, it'll also be on YouTube as well. Just look up how the frack we got here. And you'll be able to see every webcast that we've done so far. The same as off limits. And also let me not be remiss that, um, I am also a part of the, I get that reference network. That's also started by my good friend, uh, young VZA dot, um, who also has the, I get that reference podcast. He also has a random conversation with uncle VZ. He also has rhythm this where you can reminisce over the rhythm, all three great podcasts, which are usually weekly. Um, also, which can be found just like this under our Facebook group. I get that reference, which is welcome to all. I do mean welcome to all. Please do not be afraid to jump in and join us and mingle. We only ask that you just be active and just be friendly and be social. After all, this is Facebook. So with that being said, also, oh, crap. Let me not forget also my friend, also Trace, also who's a part of I get that reference that has his show called The Bump Down, which basically goes over what's hot and what's not music. And pretty much just saying, and pretty much just showing us um, why he is the musical musical connoisseur that he is, in the same way that my other friend Young BZA Dot is. And also, one last thing that I do need to say: um, the rapper that died today, uh, Triple X Nation. Um, it's sad that you know, although hip hop itself, hip hop itself is a culture. I mean, I love hip hop. I love good hip hop. Now, I may have not liked this young man's music because I truly, I mean, that's a whole other subject, but the young man lost his life today. And it's it's rough to see a young brother lose his life over dumb shit. But at the same time, it is, it is my hope that hip hop doesn't try to imitate life and life doesn't try to imitate hip hop. What I mean by that is we can have our beefs. You can have the beefs, all the beefs you want. You can have all the fights you want, but have it on words, have it on wax. When you battle, it's usually showing who's the better lyricist that day. It's not who's actually the one carrying the gun and who's actually catching the other person slipping that day because Deaths in hip hop and any type of music, when this type of violence happens, nothing is gained from this. And I'm not in, you know, regardless of how you feel about the guy, regardless of his potential issues and things of that nature, the simple fact of the matter is there are too many young brothers out there getting killed, not just him, but just too many young brothers out there who are honestly getting killed just because someone decides to end a life because. 
of extenuating circumstances that actually leads to that. I mean, I could sit there and say it's their environment. I could sit there and say it's lack of education. I could sit there and say it's lack of opportunity. I could sit there and say it's, that it's just a lack of everything that usually leads a person to say, well, I can't get this. I can't get a job. I can't move forward. I can't get past my surroundings. So what are, what else is there to do? And the one, the one, the one, I forgot my favorite rapper who says this when he goes, he goes, we are all ghetto boys. We all act this way because no one taught us how. But I'm trying to get a million dollars, hoping not to get blasted today. And I forgot the rapper's name. It's killing me to say, and it's killing me right now because he's one of my favorite rappers. But it is amazing to me because when you look at other rappers and they tell the truth and some fact of the matter about their environments and they try to be more than their environments. And nowadays, it's like the other side of hip hop is more glorified than the other side that's trying to get away from it using it. It's like, I'm going to glorify the violence. I'm going to glorify the pills. I'm going to glorify all this stuff. And there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to sit there and say that this young man died because of his actions. Now that can be argued six ways from Sunday, but I, I believe the simple fact of the matter is a man a, boy, a young man who could have been saved lost his life, simply put, because of the society that has now been created from it. And it is my hope that it does change. It is my hope that maybe one day, because I, I said the same thing with Tupac and Biggie. I think Tupac and Biggie, before they got killed, were about to actually start a revolution where it's like, this shit ain't, this shit ain't worth dying over. And I truly believe that they were about to actually start that because when rappers get a platform, much like NFL pro players, much like rock stars, much like politicians, people will follow them. And when people follow them, you can and you can influence and you can persuade. And I'm pretty much, and I'm honestly, and from the bottom of my heart, I honestly think that if one person can follow another, we can change the culture. Now it's you know rest in peace to that young man, but but until things change, I'm afraid this is going to keep going on, and that's fucked up. That's sad because honestly, if you're a black, if you're like myself, you know I'm 35 years old. By statistical by statistical data alone, I'm not even supposed to be alive right now. And that alone should tell you exactly the status of where we're at. It's just that if a young black male makes it past 21, 25 years old, he's beating the odds. We don't even, it's amazing that we still have to say that in this day and age, that if you make it past 25, hell, if you make it into your 30s, you've beaten the odds. And that alone is fucked up to say, and I wish one day we can change that. But that's subject for another day, and I don't mean to keep on running on about that. So we're going to end it here, guys. This has been how the frack we got here. Apologize again for the late start. I promise I'll be better. I promise we'll be better on the next podcast. Hope you guys have a good evening. Peace.